Michal Yashinsky, PhD, is a psychotherapist in private practice in Barcelona. He's a guest lecturer at universities in Poland and Spain, specializing in constructivist psychotherapies. He conducts workshops on memory reconsolidation and coherence therapy, which he integrates with other approaches, including personal constructs psychotherapy, brief strategic therapy, narrative therapy, and AEDP. Michał is a consultant for the Polish Psychedelic Society and works as a psychedelic integration specialist in the Hermanosis Association in Spain. He contributed to the chapter on psychedelic assisted therapy in the recently published second edition of Unlocking the Emotional Brain, the landmark book on memory reconsolidation, and was a therapist in a research project on ayahuasca assisted psychotherapy for preventing complicated grief. Michal, it's great to have you here. Hi, Niall. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. It's great to be here. So let's jump right in. Uh, before we start talking about memory reconsolidation or the therapeutic reconsolidation process or how psychedelic agents can potentially facilitate that, I'd like to ask you some questions just about the psychedelics themselves. So, for instance, there are so many different substances that are being used experimentally in therapies across the world today. When you and I talk about psychedelics, which substances are we even referring to? Uh, usually when we talk about psychedelics, we, we mean especially these, these classical psychedelics, which are uh, DMT present in, uh, for example, in the ayahuasca brew, psilocybin present in mushrooms or the so-called magic mushrooms, mescaline present in some cacti, uh, like San Pedro and Peyote, uh, and LSD. So these are the psychedelics that uh, are most researched, apart from MDMA, which is not a classical psychedelic, as well as ketamine. Uh, yeah, so we normally refer to these substances. There are uh, quite a few more of them, uh, but this is what is most researched right, right now. So uh, of the substances that you've mentioned, do they have very different effects or do they uh, do tend to have some fairly common effects uh, when used mm -hmm. as part of psychotherapy? Uh, well, when it comes to the classical psychedelics, we could say that they are fairly similar uh, effects because of this uh, mechanism of, of functioning. Uh, however, it can be different when it comes to the context as well and when it comes to uh, the fact if the the very the specific substance isolated substance is used or if it is used uh, in a more polypharmacological way like in the case of ayahuasca because ayahuasca the brew uh, contains uh, DMT uh, the the active substance the psychedelic but it contains as well some other substances. Uh, that can have, for example, an antidepressant uh, function uh, and so on. So there are there are some differences, but uh, especially when it comes to the classical psychedelics, they, they have some uh, common features like uh, in, inducing visions, inducing uh, an increased uh, emotional processing state, like being people are more in contact with their with, with their it's an enhanced emotional experience uh, somatic experience is a very strong one as well there can be some uh, synesthesia experience the experiences uh, connecting to some uh, get, getting to some experiences from the past for example including unpleasant experiences but being able to work through them to process them like traumatic experiences and so on uh, Many many psychedelics, especially in higher doses, could induce uh, some specific phenomena like mystical experiences, the experience of oneness, connection with with the world, with others, with oneself. Uh, ego dissolution as well is another uh, experience that uh, seems to have a very positive therapeutic effect uh, when it comes to. Uh, potential transformational uh, mechanisms regarding uh, regarding psychedelics. Um, yeah, uh, and well, the, what happens as well on psychedelics is uh, a, 
a deactivation or a decrease in the activation of uh, the so-called default mode network, which uh, psychotherapeutically we could translate to less rumination, less analysis, less ego defense mechanisms being active and present, which allows people to, to process better information. There's, there, there are more uh, neural, there are new neural connections uh, being formed uh, and this allows uh, new insights uh, and potentially memory reconsolidation occurring as well. But yeah, we will talk about that later. I'm curious if you can give a sense of what the recent scientific research is showing about psychedelics. Well, the conclusions are quite positive, right? The, it seems that uh, even a, a single dose of psilocybin uh, together with some, of course, good therapeutic preparation and integration, this is, this is something that, need to, that we need to stress a lot, uh, can, uh, can help to, can lead to diminishing uh depression symptoms uh for for a long time even to more or less to four or six months after after such a session the symptoms can be uh largely decreased uh there's a lot of hope when it comes to mdma for ptsd uh, so again mdma assisted therapy uh so a, a specific therapy program for uh for PT ptsd and uh, and yeah, in general, it seems that the, for example, the classical psychedelics can be a, a great tool in therapy for working with the the problems or disorders related to rumination. Yeah, so, so everything where rumination is quite potent, like anxiety, depression, uh, OCD, or eating disorders. Uh, here we can see uh that psychedelics can be a big booster or accelerator of uh, the psychotherapy process well that leads me to my next question you know here in the bay area san francisco bay area going back to the acid tests in the 1960s we've had lots of large groups of people taking lsd or other substances intentionally uh, for the purpose of personal growth but presumably there's a difference between that, which is somewhat unstructured and a psychedelic assisted therapy context. So can you give us a sense of how does a psychedelic assisted therapy context look different than just a bunch of people taking psychedelics? In mm -hmm. a yeah. So yeah, this is, this is what I've mentioned that the, the difference now is the difference between these years, the present moment and the fifties or sixties is that we know more and more about the importance of the set and setting and as well the integration uh, and the emphasis on on these um, on on these aspects leads to well be basically better results and less adverse effects so we know that uh, people should always, if possible, and it should be possible, of course, should prepare well for the uh, the experience. Whether we talk about uh, a very structured framework of psychedelic assisted therapy in clinical trials, or whether we talk about someone uh, planning to go for a retreat uh, in, in some countries, especially in countries where it's legal, like uh, Peru or, or Brazil. Um, it's okay. It's it's one's own decision, uh, but we should uh, focus a lot on the preparation and as well on the various forms of, of integration. So when it comes to the preparation, uh, so this would be the famous set. Yeah. The, uh, so we have here intention setting. So what what do you want to achieve? What do you want to see or understand uh, in your psychedelic session or ceremony? Um, getting to know uh, something about the substance, uh, how it works, to what kind of effect can you uh, get, can you anticipate? Will it affect some of your defense mechanisms? Like, because we know that in order to really immerse 
yourself in the experience, you need to surrender. You need to let go of control. And for many of us, letting go of control is very hard. And there are often some emotional schemas that uh, prevent us from doing that. Yeah, we, we often work with such schemas in psychotherapy. Um, screening is very important as well. And uh, we, we often say that a good, a good retreat center, not only a, a clinical trial, should have a screening process because psychedelics are not for everyone. Uh, there are some uh, groups of population that should not take psychedelics. Uh, people with bipolar disorder, people who have a history of uh, psychosis in their family of origin, the, the closest family, uh, people who have ha who who have had a heart attack or have serious uh, cardiovascular issues, um, and so on and so on. So there are some specific criteria uh, to be taken into account. These exclusion criteria are there. Uh, unfortunately, uh, and interestingly enough as well, after this big hype regarding psychedelics and the huge uh, enthusiasm for it over the last, let's say, 10 years, in the last two years, there have been more research on adverse effects. Uh, there is this researcher, a great researcher, Jules Evans, who leads the, the Challenging Psychedelic Experience Project, and, and they uh, focus a lot on uh, the challenging experiences and uh, what, uh, what to do to prevent them. What are these experiences? What are the, the common adverse effects? We can see that some of them are short-term, some of them can be even long-term and can require uh, psychotherapeutic or even psychiatric, in some cases, but sometimes even psychiatric help. Uh, so this is a very interesting and important to to know, to take into account. It's it's not a panacea. It's not for everyone. Uh, challenging experiences can occur. Uh, so yeah, that's the, the, the part of the preparation. Uh, then, of course, the, the session, the ceremony depends on the place, but it should be a safe place, safe setting. You should be able to talk with the people who uh, organize the clinical trial or uh, the ceremony so that you feel safe. And then the, the, the integration process is very important as well. Uh, it can happen in, in therapy room, not necessarily, not everyone will need uh, psychotherapeutic integration. Uh, integration means basically uh, giving meaning to the experience, deepening it, understanding it, and especially putting it into practice in your daily life. Yeah. So, okay, what do I do with this uh, amazing exp experience, with these these discoveries, with this insight, with these new uh, experiences that contradict some of my old, uh, deeply ingrained uh, patterns? Yeah. So integration uh, can happen in your daily life. Well, can and should happen in your daily life. Uh, journaling hel can help. Uh, taking care of yourself, being with people. Uh, talking to someone, not necessarily the therapist, if it's needed, then the therapist, of course, as well. And uh, yeah, it's it's often an ongoing process of of integration. And the picture that you're painting it sounds like it's not a matter of, from the perspective of the therapist, it's not a matter of somebody coming into your office and just you and them and them doing psychedelics. It sounds like you're describing the, a therapist being part of a much larger team perhaps at a retreat center or some sort of clinical setting where the mm -hmm. therapist is just playing a, a particular role within a larger context. Is that, is that right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's why, that's why the, the, the division of the stages uh, is often presented in, in the way that I've just mentioned, mentioned the preparation, the session and the integration. And sometimes the integration can, uh, transform into regular psychotherapy, right? Uh, so the therapist, well, in, in, a, in a ceremonial context, the therapist is, is not needed basically because it's someone else who is the, the leader of the session. It can be a shaman, it can be a facilitator and so on. So usually the therapist 
can be present in preparation, especially in, in clinical trials. Uh, they they put more focus on on preparation in a therapeutic setting, of course. So, for example, there is this author uh, from here, from from Catalonia, Mark Aishala, who's a quite a, a famous psychedelic integration specialist, and he says that basically from three to five sessions of preparation is usually enough. Mm, so intention setting, the objectives, getting to know the substance. Uh, a bit of harm reduction, psychoeducation, and so on and so on. Uh, well, from the memory reconsolidation process, we could we can talk about something more that we can do here. Uh, so this is the role of the therapist. If someone decides to uh, go to a retreat or or take psychedelics uh, in a more uh, well in a less organized context, but with a therapeutic uh, intention then maybe it would be good as well to to have a few sessions or at least to to prepare uh, on their own with, when it comes to intention setting getting to know the substance and and so on and so on so uh, in clinical trials yes then the therapists are often present as well in the room during the psychedelic session like with psilocybin but they are not interfering much yeah the the dose uh, the dose of the psychedelic is usually uh, large enough for the person to only be in their uh, introspective experience. Yeah, they are not uh, able to maintain a, a fluent conversation as it would as it would be in a in a therapeutic session. So, uh, so that's the difference. Yeah, in the in the fifties and sixties, there was another another model used as well, the psycholytic therapy, uh, which uh, which uh, involved using small doses of psych of a psychedelic, for example LSD, and then having a psychotherapy session. Uh, it was used mostly in the psychoanalytic uh, paradigm. Uh, so then, yeah, okay, we could uh, we could expect that some defense mechanisms would get dissolved, the person would be more vulnerable, more open. Um, these, uh, at this, well, these new, uh, more potent uh, neural connections would be helpful, of course, as well. Uh, the neuroplasticity, maybe even with such a small dose, would be increased. So yeah, but this is, this is a, a different model. Here, uh, the therapists, in a clinical trial, for example, with psilocybin, are there mostly for safety. From time to time, maybe according to some protocols, they would ask the uh, the participants some questions, uh, but very specific ones. From time to time, they are there as well to help if help is needed. If someone gets very scared, if if they have touched on on some you know traumatic uh experience that they uh, and they need someone to to hold them sometimes literally to help them to calm them down to breathe with them uh so this is this is the role of a therapist in ceremony setting this could be a facilitator or or a, or a shaman but usually in general we could say that the uh the interaction or the intervention in such settings is minimum so on the one hand the the intervention may be minimal, but it sounds like this is not your your hope in doing psychedelic assisted therapy with people is not just that they will take the substance and that the substance will do all the work and and just bring about some m sort of mysterious change. My understanding is that your hope is that it will help specifically help facilitate the therapeutic reconsolidation process, the process of memory reconsolidation. Correct. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so let's talk a little bit about what that process is for many people listening to this will be familiar with memory reconsolidation. Many might not. Um, so let's talk about that. And I'm aware that you really are a specialist in constructivist therapies as well. So we can bring in, I'd like to bring in both the ideas of constructivism and memory reconsolidation so that we can understand how psychedelics play a role in each. Sure. So, well, starting from a, from a definition maybe of, of memory reconsolidation, um, as, as many of our viewers and listeners know, this is, the, this is a natural 
uh, built-in brain mechanism uh, that makes it possible to uh, change the the content of a specific uh, memory that was encoded in the past uh, in our brain and that is still active. So memory reconsolidation is the process behind transformational change in psychotherapy. And uh, and yeah, we can observe it in, in many therapeutic approaches uh, like coherence therapy, emotion-focused therapy, MDR, uh, ISTDP, a AEDP, and so on and so on. And uh, our hypothesis uh, with, with Bruce Ecker, Laura Halley, and Robin Tissick, the, the co-authors of Unlocking the Emotional Brain, was that probably this is the uh, mechanism of transformational change as well in psychedelic-assisted therapy. Uh, actually, there has been already some um, research in psychedelics that suggests that this could be the mechanism or one of the mechanisms responsible for the change in, in psychedelic-assisted therapy. Uh, there was some research on ketamine and MDMA and, and as well ayahuasca, where memory reconsolidation was mentioned. Uh, but what was our interest is uh, was was actually to try to answer the question how how the therapeutic change happens in psychedelic assisted therapy and why some experiences uh cause this change and some other experiences even though they seem to be quite amazing quite insightful don't and th these questions actually were asked as well by by Mark Aishala in his book on, on, psycho, on psychedelic integration. That to me is a fascinating question because I certainly see a lot of people do powerful, powerful psychedelic experiences, some of which seem to really result in some lasting transformational change and some of which just don't seem to get integrated. So let's talk a little bit more then in, spe in specific about what the memory reconsolidation process is. Um, I'm familiar with this too, so we can talk about it together. You know, the, the basic concept of memory reconsolidation is that you, you identify a symptom, right, a target of change, and then you, through the therapeutic process of what we call discovery and coherence therapy, you identify a, a schema that the person has been unconsciously holding probably their whole lives that locks that symptom in place. And then we're looking for some sort of disconfirming, some bit of experience from their life that they may not have noticed before that would disconfirm that schema, that if they really held the schema and this disconfirming knowledge together, it's a mismatch experience, it would help really unlock that schema, right? And, and I would think it's safe to say that all of the therapies that are highlighted on experientialpsychotherapies.com achieve that in one form or another. So first of all, is that what you're talking about? And, or would you add anything to that? And then let's talk about what is the hypothesis of how, what part do psychedelics play in that? Uh, sure, yeah, I agree. And you've, you've summed it up uh, perfectly. So uh, yeah, when it comes to this, uh, the creation or discovery of the new experience of this contradictory experience that would be able to disconfirm the old emotional schema, uh, and and here we can we can as well uh, say a few words about this emotional schema that that it is it is adaptive. It's it's not uh, something pathogenic, and this is may, maybe especially the view of constructivist psychotherapies, coherence therapy included. Uh, that this is something that was created normally in the past. Uh, family of origin, peers, some traumatic situations later in life or in childhood and so on. And this, these schemas were created basically to survive. Yeah, so symptoms that stem from these schemas have a important protective adaptive function. So, so we, in constructivist psychotherapies, uh, we view these schemas this way. And it means that uh, we have a lot of empathy for them, and uh, we want our clients to have some uh, some real empathy for their own schemas. And this is what happens often in the step that you mentioned, the discovery, the discovery process, the discovery phase of uh, many of these uh, therapies. 
So, so we get there. Mm, in coherence therapy, we, we want the emotional schema to be explicit, to be discovered and integrated at the conscious level. And then we usually go to step C of the therapeutic reconsolidation process, which is the uh, discovery or, or creation of, uh, of some contradictory experiences. And yeah, and here, well, here we have many options. Yeah, you mentioned the, the exceptions from um, previous uh, experience, previous life experience. Uh, we can work on the therapeutic relationship, which is uh, emphasized a lot, for example, in AEDP. Uh, we can work with many, many imaginary techniques, imaginary techniques, uh, like, uh, well, parts work, uh, inner child work, and so on. So this is already where this kind of non-ordinary state of consciousness can occur, even in psychotherapy, right? Uh, people really are immersed in, in these strong experiences. They go back in their memory to, to, to the past, uh, to specific situations. We can together design or create some alternative scenarios and then create this mismatch experience that you mentioned. Uh, so here, if we think about what happens during a psychedelic experience, uh, well, this is actually what can happen. We People can have a very strong uh this confirming experience an experience that will be very very different to what they know about themselves to what they know about human relationships like what what should i do to maintain a relationship what should i do to avoid rejection uh, get acceptance and so on uh because very often what what people see and and are immersed in, in a psychedelic experience is some kind of an experience uh, of empathy, love, understanding, uh, forgiving, uh, strengthening of the, of the self. Uh, and very often it's very, very specific. I'm, I'm talking about it in very general terms, but very often you can go to a specific traumatic experience and really get immersed in it and resolve it in a very new way, a way that will disconfirm the schemas that were created, created on the base of this specific experience. Uh, often people would see that what they believed about themselves of their world can be, can be reconstrued and uh, this, the psychedelic experience can somehow give them this this new knowledge uh, actually what's interesting is this concept of the inner healer or the inner healing wisdom uh, uh, that is uh, that is uh, spoken about when when talking about psychedelic experiences that when and i think that this is the case of psychotherapy very often as well that when the appropriate conditions are created the context is safe the therapeutic relationship for in our case is safe there then we the therapists we don't need to do that much because often this new meanings or new knowledge will arise like in coherence therapy we talk about mismatch detection they these new meanings arise when the person is in deep verbalized contact with the old emotional schema and suddenly they can see that ah it's it's not true it doesn't need to be true uh i i have this new knowledge this new experience so something like that can happen uh during a psychedelic experience in a very potent way you uh contributed to a really interesting chapter in unlocking the emotional brain uh, which is a, a, a case study of, I think, what you're exactly what you're describing. If I understand correctly, you are not the therapist involved in the case study, but you did the six years later follow up interview with the client to see what kind of lasting effects uh, had she had experienced uh, 
really long lasting six years after the fact. So mm -hmm. could you perhaps to make this all more tangible um, for our listeners, could you give a thumbnail of how did it play out in the course of that case study and specifically what you're talking about, the, the transformational effect of, of the, in this case, I believe it was an ayahuasca experience. Uh, yes. So, yeah, it was. It was uh, this. This case study comes from a pilot study of um, uh, of ayahuasca assisted uh, grief therapy. Uh, it was actually a constructivist approach uh, designed. For, the, the therapy was designed for dealing with complicated grief and farther stages of the uh, of this research. Uh, it was a bit, it, it was changed. The topic was changed to preventing complicated grief. Uh, but it was always around the therapy for, for grief. Actually, uh, Robert Niemeyer, our constructivist uh, colleague, was, was involved there as well uh, because the technique that he, uh, he didn't create it, but I think that he kind of uh, tweaked it a bit. The restorative retelling technique was used uh, in this uh, in this research in this process, uh, so yeah, this uh, case was quite um, quite quite a potent one. Uh, it was a lady who was uh, 29, and uh, some months before she decided to participate in the research, she found out that actually that her mother, uh, who who she thought that uh, died in an accident when she was four, and her little brother was two actually committed suicide uh, by by jumping off the balcony when she when our our client we called her Alba in the in the chapter of the unlocking the emotional brain when she was present in the uh, in the apartment so uh, finding that out provoked huge uh, huge grief in her uh, depressive symptoms feeling betrayed by her by her family especially her father uh, plus some other family members uh huge sense of disorientation lack of trust in in people of course and so on uh, so she scored really high on the um uh, inventory of complicated grief you know, that was the measure uh, used in the in the study and this was a study that involved 14 therapy sessions and three ayahuasca ceremonies uh, in between these sessions. And there was as well integration after each ayahuasca ceremony. So it was a very complete program. Again, we can see that it was not only ayahuasca, it was a lot of psychotherapy as well. And uh, what happened there is that the third ceremony was really transformational for Alba. Uh, she well, she experienced what we have just mentioned. So she had experiences that really disconfirmed her previous emotional schemas regarding her mother, regarding her family, regarding life and humanity in, in general. Uh, so for example, she was able to, well, during her, her experience, she actually met uh, her mom and uh, her mom was accompanied by uh, by God. Uh, her mom explained uh, everything to Alba. Alba was able to to understand her. Uh, mom expressed a lot of remorse, uh, a lot of sadness that she that she left her children and so on. So it was a very reparative experience for Alba. Yeah? Finally, she was able to understand her mom. She was able to forgive her. Uh, she had an experience of being her mom, actually, after, after jumping off the balcony. Uh, the presence of this all-loving God was very important as well there. Uh, so many specific emotional schemas regarding her mother and how she abandoned her, how she was selfish, and so on, were changed were transformed even if they were not uh explicitly discovered in the previous sessions of therapy uh, this is something that can happen as well with with a psychedelic experience that the process of transformation can implicitly 
and we can we can later talk about what uh, what we should do or what we, we can do in the therapeutic process of integration if the transformation is not so complete as in Alba's case. And, and then she had more experiences of uh, understanding her father and her family and members regarding why they lied to her uh, during all these years. Uh, so she was uh, she, she reconstrued her emotional schema of, of her father as someone being very selfish, self-absorbed and so on. Um, she was able to see that they were actually uh, carrying their own burden after losing her de their uh, spouse or, or sister and so on. Mm. So yeah, there was a lot of empathy, uh, a lot of understanding, a lot of openness and, and being able to see the events from different perspectives, you know, which is often what happens in a psychedelic experience. There is this uh, phenomenon that is uh, talked about in ACT, in acceptance and commitment therapy, the cognitive diffusion, that I'm able to see my schemas from, from outside, from another perspective. Okay, th this is not the only way, the only perspective uh, to, to see the world and so on. And finally, in this ceremony, she as well was able to participate in her mother's funeral. So within her visions, a funeral occurred, uh, which was actually a very positive event, event like a celebration of life and death. Uh, and we must uh, uh, add that she was not taken to the funeral when she was a child, when she was four years old. Um, so there was no kind of closure. Uh, well, she was very young, of course, so it makes sense. But in her ayahuasca experience, it was an important ritual. It was an, an important closure. And uh, yeah, it was actually an amazing closure to the whole psychedelic experience for her as well, later integrated in, in therapy sessions. And uh, yeah, and the, the main changes were stable. Uh, we had this amazing follow-up six years later so it was uh, quite a long time and and we we did a very long interview uh, and uh, readers of unlocking the emotional brain can uh, can read some some pieces of this interview and yeah she admitted that uh, the main changes of the uh, the deepest emotional schemas have been stable and led to other changes for example in, in her trust towards people uh, in general, not only her family, uh, in her openness to experience in general, uh, many positive changes in practice and in, in her daily life and her relationships. She she did some more work, of course, on her on on herself. Uh, but yeah, we definitely were able to, I think, confirm our hypothesis that it was the therapeutic reconsolidation process that occurred there in this experience even if it was implicitly, but the the steps of memory reconsolidation and, and specifically of the sequence of erasure where, ident uh, where it was possible to identify them. And we saw as well the markers of transformational change, uh, the symptom cessation being the first one, the, the non-reactivation of the emotional schema and the effortless permanence of change. Which, which, as we know, are the, fair, the three markers of transformational change. I'm hearing a few things that I find fascinating in, in all that. So from my experience, bad things happen to people. And some bad things that happen, we just process and move through. And the symptoms don't necessarily stick with us. But when bad things happen and they create lasting symptoms, it's generally because of meanings that we've made about ourself or the world as a result of the things that happened, right? You used a great term earlier. Uh, what did you call it? The default mechanism of default, pro default processing mechanism. Was that the term? Uh, default mode network. Yeah. Uh -huh. Default mode network that we have that when something like this, she finds out this terrible news about, you know, how her mother actually died. And she ran that through her default mode network, which resulted in, it sounds like, a whole slew of meanings for her. Meanings about mm -hmm. herself, meanings about the world, meanings about her mother, her father. Can I trust people? Can I ever have closure? 
can I have any agency over any of this? A whole lot of meanings that the, the uh, visible result of which was complicated grief, ongoing complicated grief. And I think what I'm hearing you saying is that through that the uh, preliminary therapy sessions helped focus her on what those meanings were so that when she did the ayahuasca experiences, her her mind was already cued, primed to have to be focused on certain things. And the result of that was that it when when her default mode was shifted by the substance, she was able to have some completely different experiences in in a way I'm assuming surprising or even shocking to her in in terms of how different the visualized experiences were than how she would normally experience the world. Would you say that's a reasonable characterization or mm -hmm. well that's that's possible even though we we didn't have access to this to the transcripts of the therapy sessions from before the uh the the ayahuasca experiences uh definitely the the step a was very well uh very well done and prepared so symptom identification definitely yeah? there was clear intention uh, the whole research was, of course, about working on on complicated grief. In restorative retelling, uh, one analyzes the events step by step. Uh, so there was uh, a, a great uh, objective setting process and and analysis of uh, and and the analysis of the situation and so on. But I'm not sure because it it wasn't a process that would be uh memory reconsolidation informed so i'm not sure if the therapist in the case uh, was focusing on discovering the emotional schema uh still it worked yeah in the third ayahuasca ceremony the the new experience the the disconfirming experience was so strong that it was able to uh erase or or reconstruct the deep meanings uh, that were that were created previously. Uh, we would say, from the perspective of the therapeutic reconsolidation process, that if uh, if we were to work with a client who will, for example, participate in a clinical trial, and we are having these three to five uh, prep sessions, it would be great, like you've said, to try to discover. Uh, at least one or maybe more emotional schemas uh, in step B in the discovery process uh, that are producing the symptom. Yeah, uh, because maybe then if if they if our client has integrated this emotional schema on the conscious level, and as you know in coherence therapy we would use an index card for this aim, then they could go into the psychedelic session with something more than just an intention they would go there with the with 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 a deep understanding understanding of why they need the symptom what is the the adaptive function of the symptom what is the emotional schema behind it so maybe this would uh somehow make it more possible to uh, for for the for the psychedelic to to bring them into a a new uh, a new experience that would erase that, right? Yeah, that would make it even more specific. But what you're yeah. pointing to something really important because I think while a lot of the psychotherapies that are highlighted on experientialpsychotherapies.com are trying to bring about exactly that effect, some of them spend more time explicitly identifying the schemas than others. But yeah. But all of them are probably trying to bring about a shift in those global meanings about self or the world, whether they're specifically identifying them or not. And you're saying this is a case where they may not have done that. And yet the psychedelic agent helped bring up this, bring about this con uh, disconfir disconfirmatory experience that, that really drastically shifted her sense of self in the world. Yeah. Yeah. And and it was enough with the with the ceremony. Then there was integration, and they just verified the, uh, the 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 veracity of the transformational change. It was confirmed, 
Uh, but another scenario that I think it's important and, and very often happens, may, maybe that's the even the most frequent scenario is that a person uh, gets the the new experience, the the experience that could potentially disconfirm the the old emotional schema. So we have the step C of the therapeutic reconsolidation process happen in uh, within the psychedelic experience, but still. Uh, the transformation does not occur. Yeah, and and you know we we can see this sometimes in psychotherapy as well, especially if we don't know about memory or consolidation process. That someone has had an an uh, an amazing experiences when it comes to taking care of their inner child and so on, and and it was beautiful and there was a lot of empathy and maybe even repair, but. They come back the next week to our office and they say, okay, I'm, I'm back at square one, <laughs> right? And this happens uh, from the memory reconsolidation point of view because this juxtaposition experience, the, the prediction error has not occurred. So there was no mismatch between the, the new experience and the old emotional schema. So, well, for us, from this perspective, it's not a problem because if we have some integration sessions after a, a retreat or a, or a session, psychedelic session, we can use this amazing new experience to create the, this dissonance in the therapy room and to guide the client through the steps of transformation phase uh, in the therapy room, uh, especially uh, using the fact that uh, the the brain uh, the brain's neuroplasticity is increased for some time after the psychedelic experience really interesting so we've made we both made reference to the different steps of the recon the memory reconsolidation process the therapeutic reconsolidation process um, for those who aren't familiar with it I will post a link under this video to that that lists all the steps and with some information about that so they can understand more about it. And uh, I'm aware of the time. Unfortunately, this is such an interesting conversation. Uh, we'll have to wrap up soon. But it, it makes me also wonder for people who want to learn more about psychedelic assisted therapy, how to train in doing it or, or about maybe perhaps research. Are there particular books or trainings or resources that you would point people towards if they're interested in learning more? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, there's there's a lot of resources, and uh, as I've mentioned before, uh, there there's tons of research, uh, very fresh research in the recent years. So it's pretty easy to find articles, scientific papers on uh, psychedelic assisted therapy. Uh, when it comes to the safety, I would definitely recommend the person I mentioned before, Jules, Jules Evans, and Jules Evans and his project, uh, the Challenging Psychedelic Experience Project, uh, so that one gets knowledge about uh, you know, about the potential adverse effects and what to do uh, in order to avoid them. Uh, there, are, there are a lot of resources about integration, which I, I uh, recommend a lot. So both, both the preparation and the integration, uh, the ways how you can integrate your psychedelic experience in your daily life, even if you don't go to therapy, there's, there's a lot on the internet. Uh, and then there are many, many organizations that, uh, uh, that, that offer training for therapists who would like to become uh therapists in, in in such projects uh fluence in the state is quite a well-known one in europe we have mind foundation uh and and a few more so yeah there's there's a lot on the internet and uh, when it comes to training maps of course yeah the uh, the organization that uh, is behind behind the uh the mdma assisted therapy research as well Great. So perhaps I'll include some links to some of those under the video as well. Um, and while people are down there clicking, they can maybe add some comments uh, or questions, and we'd be happy to answer them uh, after the fact. Um, it sounds like there are a lot of great resources, though, and and it sounds like there's just this just sounds like it's such a budding field of exploration. Uh, I can't wait to see where it takes us next.
But this has been so fascinating to get your perspective on on what's happening at this at this point in time. And if you'd be open to it, I'd love to have a follow up interview at some point uh, to see where where things take us next. Yeah, that would be a pleasure, Niall. Thank you very much. And well, from my perspective, I hope that the therapeutic reconsolidation process can can be uh, an addition. Uh, uh, an interesting addition to to our knowledge about uh, the change in psychedelic assisted therapy well we'll see where this whole research uh, takes us to <laughs>